Hi, everyone. Um, I'm you are going to have such a wonderful session here today with uh, Robert Comber, Rob Comber. Um, he is a remarkable individual doing some extraordinary work. And uh, some of you may have recently seen his uh, interview with Heather Ensworth, my good friend Heather Ensworth. And if you haven't, I will put the link below this video because it really is worth watching. Um, Rob was involved in the team with Robert Edward Grant at Christmas time when they were exploring the etchings around the King's Chamber. And it was Rob here, uh, who's going to be speaking with me today, who actually deciphered the etchings. And uh, that was an incredible breakthrough because those had been there presumably for thousands and thousands of years. But it's only when we can expand our consciousness enough in the form of Rob to decipher them, we then start to accelerate that expansion of consciousness for humanity, I think, the hundredth monkey effect. So let me give you a little bit of background about Rob. Um, Robert James Comber is a cosmic architect of the mystical, which I, the phrase I love, has a multifaceted background spanning esoteric studies, scientific inquiry, the advanced human chakra system and artistic expression. He's emerging really as a guiding force in the quest to unravel the mysteries of the universe and elevate collective consciousness. And he had a, a spiritual awakening last year, which he's going to talk to us about. And from that time, he's been immersing himself in a, in a wide array of disciplines from ancient wisdom teachings to cutting edge quantum theories. And his quest for inner standing and direct experience of the divine, love that, has led him to delve deep into the hidden realms of consciousness, and he's discovered a rich tapestry of interconnectedness and divine intelligence. So he's gonna to talk to us about his work called The Lost Octave. He's also a gifted artist and creative innovator, and his work serves as a bridge between the seen and the unseen. Beautiful, I've talked many times about the power of the invisible, and, and Rob is certainly delving into that. So like many of us, he believes that we're on the threshold of a new era of human evolution, and his work reveals the hyperdimensional field of collective awakening and, and embodiment of our own divinity. Wow. Welcome, <laughs> Rob. Welcome. Delighted to have you here. This, his, your work is so expansive. It covers so much area and in, in so many areas and in so much depth. It's hard to know where to begin. But I think the place we should begin is in your spiritual awakening last year and your discovery of the lost octave. Can you talk a little bit about that with us? Yeah, thank you so much, Pam. Lovely to be here with you and uh, and all of your audience as well. So yeah, super exciting stuff. Um, yeah, my awakening actually happened uh, seven years ago oh. uh, when I was 33, but I had this epiphany of the lost octave uh, on Lionsgate on the A8. Um, but yes, ever since I had that uh, sort of awakening and that uh, sort of divine number, you could say divine timing of 33, um, I just fell in love with spirituality and, you know, with the, the, the mystical side of it, you know, so the energy chakra system, I started going into all these different courses, as probably many people do of hands on healing and all of these things. And it really just felt like it was my language, like, and I just couldn't get enough of it. So, you know, over many years of doing that i actually developed my own uh sort of healing modality or what i prefer to say is like a guidance of consciousness through the advanced chakra system um and you know from that i became a colorologist um and so you know lots of these different gifts i started to tap into uh and i just loved doing it and helping people and so really from that all of that work um really what happens quite spontaneously really on the 88 lionsgate last year was this book the lost octave this transmission that came through um because i'd actually been developing my own sort of uh, very aquarian uh understanding of like a, a different way to look at astrology um through the energy system and through color and so I've been doing that and it involves a lot of geometry and the connections. So I started to look more into astrology. And with that, I discovered that the I Ching had actually been connected to astrology. And I didn't know whether this had been done thousands of years ago, whether it was a recent thing, but I found it through a modality um, that had connected the spheres. Well, what happened was as soon as I looked at that map, I basically could see that there was a gap 
there was a, there was a, a harmonic gap <laughs> in there. And, and so this is what came through on the 8-8 was that there was this gap and it very much immediately came through about this lost octave and of course octave being eight so on the eight eight i had this transmission about the octave of an eight and there was eight gates within the i ching that were hidden that were sort of secret they were there in plain sight really but you had to see it through multi-dimensional lens and so when i looked at it through the geometry through the mathematics through music and then it started to reveal itself. And so the more that I found it, I thought, okay, let me see if I can try and disprove what I've just received. And the more that I tried to disprove it, the more actually I started to cement that this was actually even more amazing than I first thought. And so then this whole book, I knew it was gonna be a book straight away. Um, and I was told basically to stop everything, so to speak, you know, that inner voice is like, this is the only thing that matters from here on out for the next however long. And so everything else stopped. And my whole dedication over the last eight months has been living and breathing this 24 seven, because the transmission is so vast and huge. It just requires every every ounce of you. And um, yeah, I mean, the book now is nearly 250,000 words in eight months, which goes to show you how how much of a transmission it is and how quickly it's come through. Um, so yeah, that's really how I started to really weave more into astrology and discover um, things like the 36 deacons and how that worked in the great picture. Um, but because of my view of geometry and music and artistry, it was almost like looking at through astrology through a slightly different lens than what I'd heard a lot of narratives. And so for me, it was great because I was almost kind of quite fresh and I was learning it in the moment and anchoring the understandings. And the more I did that, the more it just unfolded. Uh, and just recently, I've just managed to mathematically work out how the I Ching is now able to move into the quantum and align into the quantum field, which is a massive breakthrough in, in the work. It's it, it's just extraordinary that, you know, you sort of just got this complete download of of a a divine pattern that runs all through different modalities and disciplines. And, uh, you know, that's so thrilling because it's going to make us, it much easier for other people to learn a lot of these disciplines, be it astrology or whatever. They won't have to go through the decades of slogging, calculating charts manually with logarithmic tables. It will just be a download helped by your work mm -hmm. because you're establishing a kind of template, a, a uh, a direct link for people to understand the pattern very quickly and grasp the information, therefore, because you seem to be saying, Rob, that there's an, there's an underlying pattern. It's like a divine emanation from source that is expressing in different modalities. But once you've understood one, you can easily understand others. Is that correct? Yeah, 100%. And that's why I call the Lost Octave the, the master gates, because... Uh, really it's a case of you know like a hotel room that you, if you have one key you can open all the doors and so it's not exactly like that but you know once you have sort of a, a basis of knowledge of certain patterns you know when you apply them to almost any area of your life it it seems to work so it, it's a divine sort of blueprint in a way and so really the the lost octave obviously it was eight gates that were missing or, or hidden or lost you could say within the 64 uh, hexagrams. So that brought it up to the number 72, which is this, you know, as you know, this this divine mystical number 72. And it's not actually that very well known, um, but if you start to look into the number 72, you'll see that it is everywhere because our body is 72% water. The average heartbeat is 72 beats per minute. As you know, the procession of the equinox moves one degree every 72 years you know the average age of a human is 72 the average height of a man is 72 inches six foot you know you know or the the divine proportion of a man you should say so like it, it's all there and it's all connected to things like the sacred name in the hebrew text the sacred name of god you know so it's got mysticism and physicality all connected and so what i did was i took this eight octave and then I actually increased it into a chromatic octave. So there are 12 
master gates. So a chromatic octave basically means a, a set of 12. So there's actually a full chromatic master gate octave that really once you learn this, then essentially you've got the, the master key to then move into you know all of that all of those dimensions all of those parts and they're all linked in this beautiful sort of musical scale and so it's all fractals within fractals and it, it can seem quite complicated but actually it's so simple um and as i like to share with this that you know the higher dimensions or the hyper dimensions are actually they're, they're intricate, they're beautifully intricate, but they're very, they're, they're much less complex. So this means that it's like a painting, you know, it's, it's sort of like it's got lots of different colors, lots of different range and nuance, but actually the composition is actually quite easy to see and easy to grasp. And that's really where this is translatable uh, from that hyperdimensional etheric view into like, how do we work with this on a physical everyday scale. Wow. And of course, if you take the second, you were mentioning earlier, Rob, if you take the second sign, which is Taurus and the seventh sign, which is Libra, they're both ruled by Venus. And you've been exploring Venus a lot in your work as well, haven't you? Uh, you know, divine feminine and also the orbit of, of, of Venus. Do you want to talk a little bit about that too? Yeah, absolutely. So how this sort of whole thing happened on the 8-8 was that, really came through to be a witness of what is present. And that's really what this book is very much alluding to. And so what was very present was that Venus was in Leo at the time. And she was stuck, you know, in that synodic cycle of the of the sort of lion queen, in a way. So it's the sovereign, you know, lion queen. And so I was like, okay, and of course, it's an octave and Venus is an eight pointed star. So this is where it started, all these eight started to happen. And so this was where I knew it was a transmission really coming from the divine feminine view on all of this, on the stars, on humanity, on our movement into Aquarius. And of course, we, we know we're moving to that divine feminine view. And so this is where I felt like it was a transmission from the future sent back to now for us to bring us up to speed of all of the past history, but also give us the keys you know, to move forward. So there's this beautiful way in which we can go forwards and backwards in time in this present moment. And really the whole thing is moved by Venus because she's the one that gave me the geometry because as you can see behind me is eight pointed star, but inside is also another eight pointed star. Well, that geometry in itself is a, what's known as a hypercube. So a cube within a cube, which basically means it's a fourth dimensional geometry. Well, immediately that takes us into the realms of time and space. So now we're really starting to see that the geometry is aligning up to the astrology. And then that's aligning up to the body because all of these gates are linked to our DNA. And so it's music, it's DNA, it's geometry, it's math mathematics, it's the quantum realm, it's time and space, it's the stars, it's the planets, it's the whole procession of the equinox. It's all one beautiful octave. And so that's why I say, if you learn how to understand this octave through the book, which is really beautifully simple because it's actually all done through the ancient way of sharing stories of the stars, you know, as if we were sort of together looking up at the stars and I was just sharing around the campfire. That's really the way, but it's also got, if you really want to dive into the technicalities, which, you know, in astrology, you can really go into the degrees and the, <laughs> it's all there all from the quantum realm it's all there all the gates all the numerology the harmonics all the frequencies for every single gate and so you can really get an understanding of you can actually listen to the sound of your own natal chart and that's really where that's as beautiful as it can package the star stories into this gift of you can just sit back and listen to the notes and the frequencies that your map that you were given on the earth of your natal chart uh, is showing you. It's, that's so beautiful because I've often talked about, uh, about your chart being expressed as music. And Dr. Zach Bush, just the other day, just yesterday, in fact, he was talking about 
your astrology, your birth chart being expressed as music. And so what you're talking about is it's like a homeopathic remedy that you're giving someone their pattern back when people kind of thrash around and say, who am I and why am I here? And what's my, pat you know, wh what am I meant to be doing with my life? Well, it's giving them their pattern back to make that journey so much easier for them. But I love what you're saying about the divine feminine coming back in as well. We so need that from all of these eons of toxic masculinity we need that rebalancing of the divine feminine and again that's something that was very prominent I think in in Lemuria as I understand it and I have such a sense of connection to that and um, do you want to talk a little about that aspect and how we are perhaps remembering some of the those ancient frequencies from Lemuria because it was a, a very advanced spiritual society as well wasn't it probably the the most perfect we've ever known mm -hmm. as far as we understand. so can you talk a little bit about that as well rob yeah absolutely so this is really where this understanding of how i actually discovered these lost uh octave this lost octave these gates was actually through this reversal of the pulse and so it's seeing sort of from the etheric view uh, as a spiritual being into humanity. So, you know, for, for a long time, we've seen ourselves as dense matter trying to be spiritual, so to speak. But this is really affirming that you are a star clad with a physical form. And so this is sort of like this divine feminine remembrance and reversal. And of course, the earth, in a way, is due a pole shift uh, also to happen. And so this is really where it's going. It's going into understanding this rebalancing uh, is happening within us. And so, you know, that's where we're starting to tune into that. And of course, within the book, that links us into uh, where I've narrated all about the root races, which is where Lemuria was one of the, the third root race. And so it's a deeply esoteric sort of idea, if people don't know, but uh, it's actually probably, if you read about it, it's actually probably the one that resonates the most. And this is why I think it's beautiful about the divine feminine uh, view of everything, although it's super expanded in its wisdom, you know, it's Sophianic wisdom and Sophia means wisdom. And so it's, it's Sophianic in its huge vastness, but it feels the most natural because it is. And so this is how we can start to connect and read about the root races and where we're moving now, we're, we're in the last uh, sort of aspect of the Aryan race, which is the fifth root race. And actually the sixth root race consciousness is, is here. And so the next six root race beings, children will be born. And I've now mapped out where they will be born. Um, and it is all in that area of where Lemuria used to be. And so this, oh, wow. yeah. So this idea of, you know, crystal children connecting back to crystals, to music, to being able to communicate uh, with telepathy and understanding these things, you know, they may sound super fantastical, but we're communicating through crystals, you know, through our TVs and mobile phones. And, and so really, this is really where we're going back to, but this crystallization is happening within what's gonna to happen to carbon as it moves into that silicon connection, which is essentially a, a derivative of crystal. So, you know, we're, we're, we're right at that cusp of really trying to remember that we have this ability, we have these abilities, they're in our DNA. And the root races don't just come and disappear, they absorb into the next. And so that's how we evolve. And so really that Lemurian wisdom is within us. And we know this, and I found this through the Lost Octave because I managed to speak to a scientist that is connected with, uh, you know, understands DNA. And when I showed him my work, uh, he basically said, well, this could be quite revolutionary because this is actually pointing us to a potential of where to look within the human dna because we actually have two sets of dna which most people don't know of so we have the normal helix of dna that we know of but there's actually the m what they call the mt dna which is the maternal mother line dna and they use this to basically track back the age of certain things and so this DNA that's within your body, and it's only passed from feminine, although it comes into the male, the male then can't transfer it. It's only female to fe female transference. And so really the DNA that's in your, you know, great, 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 great grandmother, it's sitting right there in your being. And so this is how we can trace through this DNA, 
all the way back to first woman, to first creation of humanity. And so this is how we start to date certain things. And this is the mitochondria DNA, which is the powerhouse of the cell. So the feminine is literally the ATP, is the, is the charge, is the power, the source of the power for, for all life. And so this is an area of uh, science that hasn't actually been explored because it's like looking for in space. Well, where do we aim our telescope? You know, wh where's the star we need to look at? So the lost octave uh, has really given a way in which to start to direct a lens into that DNA. And so if we can do that, the MT DNA is one of the reasons why certain healing uh, modalities and certain healing doesn't work with our body because the the MT DNA fights it. So if we can start to communicate with that, like we would have done in Lemuria with the sound and crystals and consciousness, we can start to connect with that maternal DNA, then we can start, that will start to accept treatments within the body that will start to help self generate self heal on a, on scales that we, we've probably never even seen on, on earth before. It's that it's the powerhouse of all life. I mean, so being able to communicate with that and work with that. Um, and so that's why I'm super excited about potentially where, you know, this work uh, could can take things, you know, with people's time and uh, looking into it further and developing it more. So we're, we're just on the edge of all kinds of quantum jumps in health solutions to the long running diseases. It's almost like a switch, isn't it? If you get the mitochondria right, it's like a switch that we can we can cure a lot of things in in that sense. And I, I I felt this was coming down the track because with Pluto square to Homer for the next couple of years, Homer's principle being very much about anti aging and greater longevity and you know curing certainly um, land as well as bodies, then there's this incredible potential for not just transformation for humanity but a complete metamorphosis for humanity and that includes our health so many healing technologies as we know are coming online already but it sounds like we're going to be entering another huge leap in our understanding of the mitochondria as a kind yeah. of switch in the body yeah absolutely and you know we're already now um with with the lost octave work you know you can see that the two strand that really they act as like a mother father. Yeah. And so we know that when we, like the alpha and omega, so, but we know that the child, you know, the, the Kai that's in the middle, it's there as the, once those two come in the right frequency hurts, now the third strand comes alive, yeah. which I've already mapped out, which you'll never believe that the middle strand is all connected to angelic numbers. So, <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, it, as I say, with this book, Pam, honestly, when I've gone into this, the synchronicities and how the numbers match up, the divine timing of everything, what's happening in the stars, what's happening in collective consciousness, it, everywhere I've gone within this book, it's there's so many synchronicities, everything matches up. It's so perfect. And so that's why it's like, wow, I just every, you know, every day, I'm just discovering more and more things. And so now we can actually see that the musical scale of the three strand DNA is actually linked to the Tesla numbers of three, six, and nine. So, so I, you know, when I'm looking at this stuff and I'm applying it all, you know, it, it's like the great year, for example, the, the great year, uh, you know, the 24,000 year cycle of the great year resonates at the note G and the note G in the, in the, Selfridgeo scale is the word soul, S-O-L, it's the sun. So how perfect is it that the procession of the equinox resonates as the sun frequency, which is the soul as in S-O-U-L. So it's like the soul system. The soul system is the souls. It's just so mind blowing when you look at it all. I and, do, I, yeah, sorry to interrupt, go ahead, yep. Yeah, and it's, you know, as I say, I've looked so many different ways at all of these things. And it's like, you know, the, the word, the letter G, for example, well, when you have the 26 letters of the alphabet, you know, in the cursive, in the small letters, and then you add seven, which is G and capital letters in total, it's 33, which is the 33 vertebrae of the spine. It's like everywhere we go, 
it's just synchronicities everywhere. It's all alluding to the same stuff. And that's why I say, if you learn the patterns, learn these keys, learn your star story, learn your frequencies, it, it, everything starts to flow. And you're like, okay, this is this. And it all fits like a beautiful <laughs> symphony of the stars, honestly. Yeah, Amazing. incredibly magical journey. It's interesting you're talking about soul, solar, because mm -hmm. um, I was talking to Dr. Jude Caravan, cosmologist recently, and in her latest book, Gaia, she spells it with a U, solar system. Yeah, absolutely. Solar within the system. So, so, you know, I don't know if you read her book, but it's so interesting. She uses the same, um, the same word as well. And in that conversation, we were also talking about about water, how water holds memory. And water, of course, is very ancient. A lot of the water on our Earth is at least 4.5 billion years old. And she was saying some of the water on Earth is older than our sun, literally older than our sun. And so that knowledge of ancient um, civilizations that had so much wisdom, so much understanding, is still in the water. It's never been lost. It's never disappeared. And we are just now beginning with your work and other amazing pioneers are starting to be able to access that and remember that wisdom, bring back that frequency of a much more spiritually connected um, you know, race, really, of humanity. And it's all sitting there for us. And also, it's so interesting, Rob, I want to pick up what you were saying about the pole shift. And yes, it is expected that the Earth will have another pole shift, but my sense is this is an energetic flip for us. It doesn't have to be a physical one. It's it's a it's a jump in understanding. And if we can achieve that, my sense is, and it's a question to you as well, can we avoid the physical pole shift? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that it's a, I think the catastrophes that have been linked to pole shifts can be averted if the pole shift happens within you. And that's why I say this is very interesting for me, obviously, receiving this Venusian download. And as you said, you know, number 72 with the, the the seventh sign is libra venus the second sign is taurus venus so it's 72 is venus venus which i couldn't believe was just you know too unbelievable um but yeah we, if we can you know as i'm going through this you know presenting this venusian wisdom as a male but having this divine feminine transition you know of like the the consciousness and seeing how it works it's amazing because it does feel so much more natural it balances the hemispheres and how you perceive, perceive things and in a way it actually works more of how the soul sees the world you know it's not necessarily the human psyche trying to perceive the soul it's more like this how does the soul see through your eyes and that's really this integration of the divine feminine and as you were saying about the water that's the that is this internal dna because it was formed when the earth had no atmosphere and so that sort of uh those cells were on the earth and then when the earth started to form its atmosphere then another cell came and said well if you power me i'll protect you and so the mitochondria got protected um by this sheath and then that is still the same thing that is in, happening in our body that was billions of years ago and that's still running through our very bodies right now so there is a full connection to all the way back to first woman to first life in a way on earth you know if we have the technology to actually track how that works but it's there meaning that all of that is here meaning that all of those root races it's all here also and that's where i feel like you know this parallel line is running that that lemurian wisdom is is able to flow into our now perception and that water that memory and that crystallization and understanding of of all of those things it's it's right here and so these technologies what we're sharing and the lost octave it's all trying to bring us back into understanding this you know and integrating this wonderful and i mean we we know that we're made of stardust we know that the iron in our blood comes from the stars the calcium in our bone comes from the stars so what you're saying about the mitochondria coming from the first woman on earth could we even track back beyond that back to our galactic heritage and is it possible that the, the same mitochondria might be flowing in a line from from the galactic beings yeah i mean well i think that's the beauty that's what i mean i think the the tech do we have the, you know the technology is going to be the limitation which is quite ironic because we feel that yeah. technology is evolving so fast which it is 
but we we know that consciousness way is so much more further in advancement than technology has to catch up with and try and measure what we already know and so i think that's going to be the beauty of discovery is that really everything that we feel that we know to be true will probably just be end up being proven more and more and more as i've found with the lost octave but i think you know that that idea of moving backwards in time and moving forwards in time is that we're also able now in a, the consciousness wise you know with things like this that we can start to see how we can connect with that next jump forward into that galactic consciousness and that's why in the book i wrote about that this book is the initiation of ether and so you know much has been spoken of of the four elements but you know ether has been one of those topics that's like well how do you really understand it because we're going into the t the space and time uh, continuum you know like how do we understand that but what we do know is on things like geometry is that once you understand certain geometries they move through every dimension you know certain that means that then certain notes certain colors certain bandwidths it, it's sort of like this holographic fractal universe so once you know the keys and patterns which the lost octave shares with you then what applies to one dimension applies to all others maybe in various degrees but essentially it works so you have a portal through into understanding ether and from that top-down view which isn't uh it isn't exalted and lofty it's actually very natural and earth connected because the the further that in order to go higher the roots have to go deeper and so it's not just about ascension of moving out of body it's actually about working even closer with mother earth like in lemurian times in order then to connect to that galactic consciousness also which i think is beautiful and when you're when you are the ether then you then you're everywhere then you're <laughs> there's no limitation to you you can be in everything and everywhere so that's what this is showing us that you can go outside of time in your consciousness forwards and backwards you know the procession and precession and that's really where you can start to integrate all of this in the in the now moment wow but it's it's from your expanded consciousness that you've been able to see that it's just moving out of linearity isn't it in our 3dness that we've been living in for so long and just expanding the consciousness to realize we are everywhere and you know that the world the, the world is the universe is within us as well and it's so interesting about the connection back to the earth because one of the things i love about the dwarf planets also i describe as a, the higher octave of consciousness as well is that all the ones I've researched so far have this deep, deep instinctive connection to Gaia, to nature, it can be shamanic practice, but it's a deep understanding of her natural rhythms and that we are completely connected to her rather than separated from her and exploiting her as we've been, I think, in our lifetimes in this, you know, in this toxic um, masculine um, paradigm that we've been living in. So this is a beautiful jump on in so many dimensions and so many levels, Rob, with the work you're, you're doing. And what is it what is it saying about the new human, as you describe it? Mm -hmm. What is this telling us? What's, what's your work telling us about frequency, about gifts and abilities? And, and, and are we just remembering something ancient or are we bringing something else into the picture as the new human? Yeah, no, beautiful. And I think the the easiest way to understand this, in, which I've written in the book, is it's called the law of octaves. And so when you know music, it's essentially that the first note is the same as the last note, except that it's just in a higher octave. But essentially, they're the same. And so there's this beautiful sense that at the beginning is the end and the end is the beginning. That is the law of octaves. So essentially it's a bit like knowing the storyline or knowing how the thing's going to finish at the very beginning well a lot of people may feel like oh well that's not an adventure but you know this is our lives and the future of you know the collective consciousness it's quite nice to know the end at the beginning because actually what it does is it relaxes you and allows you to move through the journey knowing that the end is all is inevitable what it is that you feel in your heart that's going to happen is going to happen because you know that at the beginning so then it's not a sense of trying to find and like how do we get to this next stage it's like well i already know that the end of this movie there's going to be a happy ending but how it gets there 
there's twists and turns in our choices and how we do things. So, but inevitably it's going to be there. So I think with this idea of the ether is that it's pulling in from both. It's pulling in from the past. So it's bringing the, what was lost back into our knowledge as a serious immediate update into our <laughs> spiritual evolution. But it's also bringing in from the future into the now. And of course we create that future in the now. And so it's, it's really both. And that's what I think is the, the understanding of this being able to work non-linear, you know, non-sequential as well as being sequential, you know, I mean, it makes sense that we move forwards in the Zodiac, but yet in the great year, we're in precession, we're moving backwards. So there's these two forces working together that align us into the presence. And so we've only really been able to use the forward motion. But as we go into galactic consciousness of the precession, we're able to use retro causal, you know, and go back in time, you know, and go future in time. And so this is the beautiful ability that we have. And we think, well, how do we get there? It's really easy by understanding your story, understanding the stars and understanding things like the law of octaves, because everything is fractals and harmonics of each other. And so if you understand just one, I, I say like in this, in the gate, if you understand just one gate out of all of the 72, just one of them, just one gate, if you go through it all the way through, you'll end up in the same place as everywhere, as all the others. So everywhere leads to the same one thing. And it's the same as when we look through the microscope, when we go all the way down to try and go into the quantum field, what I've basically hypothesized and seen, foreseen in this, really as a prophecy is that actually you'll go all the way down and you'll end up in space. And so the same thing, if you go infinitely large, you'll let, you realize that you're just one great big atom. And so it loops on itself. And so this is really this understanding of like, actually everywhere is available to us. We just need to understand how to move into those next octaves to receive those bandwidths. And it's all laid out in, in the book and understanding the stars. Wow, it's so holographic and you're really giving people a template, you know, a, a user manual, if you like, um, using the stars as well in terms of how they do that, which is such a, a, an immense service to humanity. So do you feel, I don't know if this is a relevant question for you, Rob, but, but do you feel this will get us out of the reincarnation loop? Well, I mean, that's it's an interesting one, I would say, because, you know, actually yesterday I wrote about the cosmic initiations, which is, it's huge about the oversoul because, you know, we, we've, you know, these are sort of fairly esoteric ideas, but th this is how the, the higher dimensions work as these fractals, because, you know, we have say that the higher self and the monad and, but then you have the oversoul and then the oversoul goes through things like it becomes a planetary logos. So like Gaia, Gaia is a planetary logos, and then it becomes a solar logos. So like the sun, and then you become a solar system, and then you become a galaxy, and then you become, you know, multiple galaxies. And so it just grows and grows. So I would say for sure that it's a spiral of different octaves. And so I think that this sense of, you know, uh, we may want to reincarnate and, and move into different dimensions of experience of imagine having experience as being a planet. I mean, Gaia's experience of, of that consciousness must be incredible in the things that you learn and understand, you know? And so I think, yeah, the whole, what we're moving through advancement is so that we can start to choose the next scales of, of how we want to experience, you know, within a body also, whether we want to experience it as a, galactic consciousness or planetary consciousness, a solar consciousness, or are we going to keep ourselves in a narrow band of purely just five senses and a physical reality? And I think that is so fastly being deleted. I think m even most people are starting to experience a sense of intuition, at least. And so the more that we can prove uh, and show, not only really improve, but you know, show these synchronicities like in Egypt that we that we showed and that it's a, a stargate with astrological signs. You know, the more that we can show these things, uh, the more that we can show how DNA works and how the stars are connected to that, then it, it brings about that left brain of like, OK, that qualifies it. 
and then the learning happens through the beauty of the stories you know like children learn the best through direct experience and story it's uh, humanity does time and time again and that's what this transmission of the lost octave was that's why it was never written down because it was you know the final teachings of all masters in tantra and traditions they would always give the last teaching as a verbal thing they would never write it down because it's it's the key that opens all the doors and so you're only ready to possess that key when you've done that work in a sense but what this lost octave is showing is that here are all the keys and now it's for you to move through it you know because again even if you give people the keys and the uh, open the doors whether they walk through them or not is a different question so now it's a case of these are the star stories to help say look this is a journey that you, you should travel on it's it's uh, going to be great for you great for your life and these are the things that are going to help you along the way and these are the gifts that you can start to work with and so it's an empowerment and that's what i think the feminine is about you know it's the mother that stands back and says this is it you need to do it but i am right here and it's it, it's going to be a, a hell of a ride and so you know that's the that is the divine feminine you know that the beauty the love the colors the smells the tastes all of the body senses to work with the understanding that you're part of this huge uh, galactic consciousness i mean we really are um part of the stars and planets i mean it, it's becoming even more obvious especially with things like the eclipse that we just had yeah and i'd, I'd love to talk about that rob you know it's it's beautiful the work you're doing it, i think already people are having a stronger and so, stronger sense of greater greater psychic sensitivity telepathy greater healing ability i mean that's coming online so fast for people now but the eclipse, yeah, I mean, in my own experience, just observing people and people writing to me all the time, it was certainly the week before the eclipse, we were building up with great intensity. And I, I had a hell of a week myself, as you know, so great intensity building up to it. But then knowing that the solar eclipse was exactly to the minute conjunct uh, an asteroid called Chiron, that's known as the Wounded Healer. I, like many other astrologers, really felt that, you know, forget the hype about the eclipse. Um, it was actually to do with a profound healing individually and collectively. And there seemed to have been a sort of collective out breath going through the, the, the solar eclipse. And it, it, so many people, and I, I wrote a very, very simple post. I thought it was too simple, really, on social media this morning, saying how the energy felt lighter, it felt clearer, that issues that had seemed intractable or challenging relationships or health conditions just seemed to have dissolved over that period of the eclipse. And so many people were sort of jumping online and saying, yeah, I'm feeling that. Yeah, you know, you wouldn't believe it, but this thing that's been running for 40 years is just resolved now. And there, there is this feeling of we've shed or purged or we've just let it go and we're like a bubble, like, we're like a hot air balloon now rising with a much clearer lighter energy everybody is feeling it. I certainly have felt it in a very visceral way and so can you talk a little bit about that and the deeper things you were also seeing around the eclipse as well yeah absolutely and and that's interesting about Chiron because in the star law that's uh Centaurus which is one of the deacons uh which is in Virgo uh which is you know Mercury so it's very interesting um that you say about that so yeah, the, the eclipse was amazing in a way because, you know, so much build up because, you know, a lot of people cottoned on to the the deacon that was in there was to do with, which is Cetus, which is, you know, in the star law, in one aspect is seen as the sea monster. Um, and so there was this whole sort of thing about the sea monster and, you know, Aries and all of this. But actually, when you really know the star law, what was happening was that the eclipse was actually happening in the band that joins Pisces, the two fish of Pisces. And the band is a deacon uh, in Pisces. And so that band that connects the two fish where they try to swim off in different directions, they could never get very far because it's actually connected to Cetus, that sea monster. And so that sea monster essentially is the one that was holding the fish back from fully expressing the Piscean wisdom that's been there. And so this is from the all the way back from the age of Aries till now. 
and so really that what happened was that solar eclipse was basically a cutting through of that ribbon and so that meant that now these fish which are actually really dolphins the the true understanding of pisces is, is two dolphins um and so they're two dolphin lovers and so they actually are these golden dolphins that are now set free and of course this link to music is the sonar of the dolphins the hemispheres of the brain the creative and the logic it's like everything about the dolphins the oceans lemuria all of this was all held there but of course that's one part of it so now we're starting to see the best we're going to see the best parts of pisces now because we we've only ever seen that the dark age part and all of the the suppression and that being held back you see and that's the ribbon well now the band is cut they're free and so this is what pisces that neptunian energy is really going to come in and say like okay you really want to understand about the soul and consciousness it's like poseidon's trident you know it's like full like you know bringing the dream worlds mirroring into the physical realms it's it's going to be really magical so that's that part of pisces but then the other part of cetus is that uh one thing i found out is that within cetus is actually the oldest star in the entire universe which is amazing so in this whole constellation that we had is the oldest star in the universe is when this eclipse was happening next to and so this oldest star is actually uh, named after one of uh, J.R. Tolkien's elven uh, um, landscapes called Arendelle. Now, oh. Arendelle was in the movie, which is in the, this, this star in a glass jar. And she, she, the elven princess hands it to um, Frodo, I think it is, and says that basically this is starlight in a jar. Oh. So this conjunction happened right at this point. And Cetus... The other part of Cetus this is not a sea monster, but the great whale. Mm-hmm. Now, the great whale is is the understanding of that which comes from the deep, so the deep subconscious. Now, of course, whatever comes from the subconscious, once it breaks the surface, it's either going to be a monster or it's going to be a beautiful whale doing their you know beautiful flip. And so, this archetypal understanding of the whale is what Avatar was all about, which was where they entered the mouth of the whale. And what were they after? They were after the nectar, which is basically held within the pineal gland, which is the divine Amrita. And so that's in the third eye. And so they were trying, going in the whale to take extract the Amrita from the whale. And so that's an age old story that was in Pinocchio story where Pinocchio and his father were swallowed by the whale and they were in the belly for three days, which is 72 hours, the number 72. And so (laughs) it's, it's this understanding of you have to go into the depths. The sun is swallowed by the whale, like the eclipse. And then you go into the depths and then you emerge the resurrection. And what I saw was that the, the moon was actually the biblical stone of the tomb. And so the stone moves and rolls off of the tomb. And then of course, new light comes and that's the resurrection. And so, you know, Pinocchio and his father resurrect come out of the whale And this is what happened, that basically we had that understanding of going into the depths, freeing ourselves from the ties. And then now all of a sudden we're in this new light. And now the dolphins are swimming straight for the waters being poured from Aquarius to drink of the divine feminine waters. So all of that Lemurian wisdom that you're speaking about, it was all in these, you know, stories of Avatar, the whale, it's everything we've just experienced and i really do feel now we're going to start to experience the the best of pisces to finish up this age you know to merge ourselves blend ourselves more seamlessly into the aquarian age and again avoid that sense of water catastrophe those big floods if we can do this you know pole shift within ourselves yeah beautiful it was the sun and moon pisces this is music to my ears Rob, because that's that's absolutely wonderful but it's it's so interesting as well that i've just you know in, in my updates i've been describing april as a as a kind of ignition point as a spark point as a jumping off point um a quantum leap and that does seem to be what you're you're seeing in the eclipse as well and it's so interesting as well because um a year, about a year ago march 22nd several people several local 
psychic people who I respect greatly and also Jim Self and also Jeffrey Hoppy, who channels um, Adam of Saint Germain, they were talking about something called Heaven's Cross, where this second layer of light was was coming in for us. And that one by one, as we each were able to expand our consciousness, we would we would pop into that that second layer of light. And I was just listening to um, some channeling from Jeffrey Hoppy again this morning, and he was talking about this, how we are now integrating this. And so, the, the, you know, the stone moving away, rolling away from the tomb as the moon moves away from the sun is like that new light, that new quality of light that's coming in for us as a, as a key ingredient to jump us into the new human. Yeah, absolutely. And and I, I even put in the book, um, how to work with this book is, uh, I actually developed what I call the quadrinity psychology, uh, which is the uh, acronym of LITE, L-I-T-E, because you have the, the these four words that help you integrate these master keys master gates and so you have the light which is the sort of the highest essence of the the light the integration which is how to start to bring that in the transformation which is what we need to do in order to fully pull this into the body and then embodiment is the last one of how does that light look like in human form and so this is the quadrinity psychology that is within every gate that gives you the understanding of the the star law the deacons and also how to how to understand these this staging of embodying that light so we start to bring that higher octave as you say this cross of light merge it into the body bring heaven onto the earth you know and that's what it's really about this this divine feminines the understanding of bringing this as one you know working together so it's all there in the book that's super beautiful and the way in which I present that is through this notion of what I call the way of transparency which it's you have the initiation of ether but how to start to work with this is is the way of transparency and in the I Ching and those Taoist techniques they always talk about the way it's almost like the you know the the, the way of the Tao and it's it's a sort of it's a way of being and so transparency is basically try is you're imagining yourself in a way that if you were completely see-through if you're completely transparent then really there's no there's no blocks in you there's no there's nothing that gets in your way you can move through anything you can be anywhere you can receive everything everything's moving through you and around you and so therefore you're connected to everything and, you know, there's been lots of practices that people have used of, you know, being still, trying to meditate or dancing or breathing or what. But for me, the way in which I actually used to write the book was this way, because I just literally was here and just was observing and being transparent what was around me. And it was almost like I could see the stars, I could feel the energy. And I just, from that, I could just process all of it. And I could understand all of it. And it's very Aquarian because it's so instantaneous because you're not going anywhere. You're not trying to reach a certain level. It's just exactly where you are in your physical form. And so therefore this sense of feeling grounded and connected, but yet having very celestial wisdom also coming through. And so all of these things are, are in the book. And, um, and I even put in there about how to change your beliefs as well, if you want to speak about that. Yes, I'd love to. And it's really being in the moment, isn't it? Being in the present moment, absolutely focused in that moment. And that's what allows all this to happen for you as a as a receiver, essentially, as a receiver of this divine wisdom, which is wonderful. Yes, I'd love just for you to touch on as our final final point about how you can break through beliefs, because our beliefs have been so incredibly limiting and we always think it's the external world. But of course, it isn't. It's our own filter that gets in the way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, this sort of goes into this understanding of the of how to do things in a new way. And because it is nonlinear and like the octaves, it's like, you know, the result already in a way you just don't know, you know. And so it's 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 understanding that these beliefs can be changed instantaneously. And so really it's working from the top down. So it's working on the mental body because the shroud that the mental body it houses the emotional body which houses then the physical so we've worked from the body up which is great also in different ways but from from this wisdom the star wisdom 
Well, if we can change the mental plane, then all the other bodies follow suit like a sort of a fractal. And so when I was writing the book, you know, I came across different things that I wanted to make sure I could bring it through in the purest way. And so I hit my own sort of glass ceilings. And so I asked for this sense of, well, how do I change this? And then the next day, this epiphany happened of the there's a mechanical way, like a loophole of how the mind works. And so if you can sort of understand that, then it completely flips. It makes your mind work for you rather than against you. And it is instantaneous because as soon as you receive the answer of the reasons why it's validating for you, that belief, you know, is done. And it's and I put this in the book because there's a lot to, you know, to, to move through and just receive. But you may feel that you'll hit against your own, you know, beliefs or oh, it doesn't feel quite right. It feels I don't quite in, integrate it. It doesn't feel quite there. So it's in the book as a gift in the book to say this will be able to give you a chance to change any belief instantaneously, which is a massive, bold statement. But if I hadn't have done it myself, I wouldn't say it. But I literally wrote down 13 of my beliefs I had, Pam. And within seconds, I was like, done, done, done. And I was like, I couldn't believe how fast it happened because almost in a way, once you know how to, like you were saying, the 100 monkey effect, once we know how, then all of a sudden everybody else knows how. And this is like the four minute mile, you know, once we break through the threshold of something, and, and this is in there as a sort of a, a gift to say, look, it's all here to help you. It's all here. There's nothing hidden. And that's the way of transparency. This book is nothing's hidden from you. There's no like, oh, this little slight calculation that I don't want pe to share with people. Everything's laid out. You can see exactly how I did it, how I discovered it, how you can look at it. And then you can walk through it with with all of this wisdom to yeah make uh, make the best of your your journey, your life. Well, this is such, your work is so extraordinary, so pioneering, Rob, and such a gift to humanity. You really are going to help us make these quantum leaps that we're seeing so clearly in the astrology. We've still got Jupiter-Uranus conjunction coming up later this month, and it just keeps on coming in these leaps. But your work is going to really enable us to, to make bigger steps, bigger leaps, because it's it's giving us the, the template, if you like. And so people can order your book, pre-order your book online, Rob. Yes, absolutely. So the book is scheduled to be out. Uh, I'm fingers crossed the first week of May. Uh, as I say, I've added in so much stuff. It's now over 250,000 words. I mean, it's really is, although it sounds huge, it's really like an encyclopedia, but it's all done through story. So don't worry about it. It's not heavy, but all the mechanics are there, but it's all done through story. So yeah, it, you can pre-order it on the website. Uh, and that really helps greatly with the work coming out and, um, you know, helping share all of this into the into the community. And of course, the 1st of May, um, Mars moves into its own sign of Aries, zero of Aries. And I always describe that as the creator degree, very first degree of the zodiac on the world axis. So a, a magnificent timing if you can get that on the 1st of May. Absolutely beautiful. Now, I know there will be so much interest from from everyone who's listening because it's your work is it is so unique. It's like nothing else out there at the moment. You really are leading the field and helping all of us on our journeys. So, so you know, God bless you, Rob, for everything you're doing in the world. It's it's really special, and I know everyone will have loved our conversation. And I just wish you all blessings in everything you're going to be doing. You're you're so young in the journey as well. You've got so many more decades to go of discovery and excitement. And I know you're going to be helping humanity all the way through. So, um, yeah, love this conversation. And uh, I hope everyone else loved it as much as I did. It was really special. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Pam. And for also for, you know, sharing me onto your platform. And, you know, it's none of this work can be seen, you know, without people helping people and, you know, for you to invite me on here and, um, you know, share this message to get it out to the wider community and for all your work that you're doing as well. You know, the Lost Octave is, it, it, it gives you so many insights, but it's also a way to, to say that, you know, what you're doing with your work with astrology, there's such a vast wealth to know all that as well. So, you know, it, it's just combining that these things are all working together and it's through the awareness of channels like yours and the work that you do. So I, I thank you so much for having me on.
It's been a great. Bless you. We've each got a, a unique piece of the puzzle, Rob. Absolute joy to speak to you today. And lots of love to everyone out there. God bless. Bye for now.